Hello, Star Trek fans, and welcome to the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. My name is Kim. And my name is James. And we're watching Star Trek Deep Space Nine from the beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, we are on Season 3, Episode 7, entitled Civil Defense. This episode aired November 7th, 1994. Before we start on this one, anything to say about the previous episode? No, it was perfect. How many boob rants did you have to edit? Um, I think there was only one really good long rant in there. Well, actually, maybe there was two. <laughs> we do have some further information, though, on that one. You do? Yes. I did make a comment in that episode that if we get it wrong, we'll get letters. So I went and looked it up, and a Bajoran year is 0.8 human years. So it's actually shorter than an Earth year. So theoretically, this woman who looked 30 is around the same age as Jake. Well, she said she was 20, and it came out at she would be about 16. Uh-huh. Okay, so where did you reference this information from? I got that from Memory Alpha. But that's not something from the show, right? It's Oh, no, I didn't find anything in the show. Okay, so it's not really point. canon. It's somebody's canon. <laughs> it might be from one of the books. Okay. I did not dig into it further. Moving on. I mean, the good news is this episode is better. <laughs> It's a better episode for women, aliens, people everywhere. Well, maybe not for Gul Dukat, <laughs> but everybody else. <laughs> but it's okay because Gul Dukat is gross and awful. So. Oh, poor Gul Dukat. He gets such a bad rep. Poor Gul Dukat. <laughs> yeah. Probably because he's a terrible person. Because he's terrible, yeah. All right, should we get started? Absolutely. In the cold open, Jake and Miles are doing some work in the old ore processing section of the station. They talk about what it must have been like when the station was Terok Nor. Jake asks how the Bajorans survived the conditions, and Miles points out that a lot of them didn't. Yeah, the temperature used to go to 55 C. Right, which is 130 Fahrenheit? Yes. Something? It's very hot. Or as people from Arizona would say, it's a fairly warm day. A normal summer day. Yeah, exactly. We're not frequently reminded anymore of what a horrible place this used to be yeah. and how horribly persecuted the Bajoran people are. So this was a little reminder of the place that we live. Right. They're living on somewhere that was effectively a labor camp. A forced labor camp. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So I guess Jake is still doing his apprentice work with Miles, even though he's expressed his disinterest in Starfleet. I yeah. thought that was kind of interesting. Jake's job here is to try and delete all of the Cardassian files from the computers so they can load a new operating system and start using this processing plant as a deuterium refinery. Did you notice Miles is in full worker man Miles mode? Absolutely. Got the sleeves rolled up. Did you also notice his uniform was dirty? Oh, yeah. I did notice that. Yeah. Although Jake's was very clean until yes. the end. They're all a little bit roughed up by the end. Well, it did make me laugh in that situation of Miles is kind of grubby and looks like he's been working and Jake looks pristine. Yeah. Well, Miles is the one who's going to crawl in the dirt. Isn't that the thing you get the apprentice to do? I suppose, unless it's your boss's son. Oh, you know what this is? Sweet, innocent Jake. This is Miles not delegating again. <laughs> yeah, it kind of is. You should have the kid crawling around in the dirt. Yeah, precisely. I think Miles is maybe just too nice. It's oh. like, I'll do it. <laughs> I am more convinced than ever that Miles truly believes nobody can do it right unless it's him. Yeah, I think that's true. Or Bajoran religious fundamentalists. They can also do it as well as Miles can. Well, just that one. It was, yeah, it was a woman who was going to leave uh, Keiko and his child for. <laughs> yeah. It still seems like we don't quite understand how networks work. He is going to put a new operating system on these computers, and he's talking about moving a file to the other computer in ops. And it's like, we still don't quite get that everything is just connected or should be <laughs> connected on the station. Well, the writers probably have little understanding of how networking really works. Well, anyway, they're hard at work when Cisco enters to remind them that they've worked through dinner time. Jake is trying to delete one last file, but for some reason he can't get it to go away. So Miles takes a look. He says it's strange because the file has no name and there's no info on what it is. Shouldn't this be a red flag? Immediately. He says he'll set it aside for now and then transfer it to the computer in ops in the morning so he can analyze it. And I wrote down, don't do that, Miles. <laughs> <laughs> do not transfer a file you don't know anything about to the central computer system. Have we not learned anything from the Doghouse episode? Clearly not. That's exactly what I was thinking as well. Well, I mean, the show is still pretty episodic. Yeah. But let's at least learn from our mistakes that nearly kill everyone. Right. Well, when Miles goes to move the file, it seems to trigger something. And we hear the computer announce that there was an unauthorized computer entry in Ore Processing Unit 5. And then it says Miles has five seconds to enter the access code. 
which of course he doesn't know, so an alarm starts blaring and the doors all slam shut around them. Five seconds is awfully quick to type in a code. (laughs) Yes. Then we jump to Ops, where we see Dax, Kira, and Bashir. I can only assume Bashir is hanging around here so that he has something to do in this episode. Or else he's just there mooning over Dax, I'm not sure. No, I think he was just looking for something to do. Shouldn't he be in medical? He should be. Well, they hear a computer announcement in Ops that says, Warning, worker revolt in progress in ore processing unit 5. Security countermeasures initiated. Uh Uh-oh. And then we pop back to Miles, Cisco, and Jake, and they're trying to force the door open, but it's not budging. And now a recording of Gold Ducat comes on screen. He very ominously says, Bajoran workers, your attention, please. Your attempt to seize control of this facility is going to fail. You are valuable workers and we wish you no harm. (laughs) However, if you do not return control of this unit to your Cardassian supervisors, we will be forced to take action. You have eight minutes to make your decision. Well, it's nice to know that they won't be harmed if they surrender. Right. (laughs) Cisco stares at the screen with his hands on his hips and we cue the theme song. This is the most dangerous summer job Jake could have. Yeah, it really is. My most dangerous summer job was working at the zoo in my hometown when a tornado hit. (laughs) That's pretty dangerous, yeah. It was very dangerous. When I saw the people running out of the zoo, I thought something had escaped, which seemed dangerous, but no, they were running because a tornado was about to hit. Not good. But anyway, we all survived. So what we've discovered here is that the Cardassians have built-in automatic security protocols if something goes wrong. Yeah. Couldn't they have learned something for the Cardassians here? (laughs) Wow. You would think they would learn something, or you would think that maybe these things would have come up a few other times, like when that virus got onto the station or when the Jem'Hadar just beamed in and walked through the containment field. You'd think something would have triggered this, but apparently not. No. After the ad break, Miles, Jake, and Cisco are trying pointlessly to pry the door open. Kira calls Cisco, asking what's going on. But anyway, he says, We seem to have tripped some kind of automated security program left behind by the Cardassians. Kira tries to beam them out, but they get the same enter access code message we heard before. Kira's annoyed that the Cardassians never bothered to share this code before leaving the station. Of course. Have they tried calling Quark? He's got all those data rods sitting in the drawer behind the bar. Yeah, the spark plugs. Yeah. At this point, Odo calls from security saying his Cardassian access codes are still valid and he's trying to override the security program, but he doesn't think his security level is high enough. And speaking of Quark, in he comes to security complaining that his customers don't like all these scary messages and alarms. Not a surprise. No. When Odo tells him to leave, Quark asks if he can help and Odo says not unless you have level 9 Cardassian security clearance. And we learn that Quark has level 7, which shocks (laughs) Odo because he only has level 6. And then Quark tries to sell him level seven, which I thought was pretty funny. Very smart. So <laughs> so Odo tells him to leave again. But Quark sits down thinking the security office is probably the safest place on the station. I think that's actually a smart move by Quark in this situation. Being near Odo is a pretty safe place to be. He does manage to remain out of trouble. And if something yes. goes wrong, he's very good at fixing it. And also, I think Quark knows that Odo would protect him, which he would. Well, he's done it before. Odo went with them in the camping trip episode to help right. rescue Quark. Yes, he did. It's called the Jem'Hadar, but I'm always going to call it the camping trip. I understand. That's uh, very relatable to me. Back down in ore processing, Cisco is trying to open the hatch above the giant pipe, but that is also sealed. Gold Ducat comes on again saying it's not too late to surrender and save their lives. Cisco tells the computer that he's the leader of the Bajoran workers and he says, we surrender. Then Gul Dukat says he's glad they've come to their senses, and he tells them to stay where they are, and they'll be arrested, but not harmed. I thought that was a smart idea, because like he thought, the computer would go into a waiting mode. Yeah, it gave them a few minutes. Yeah, it was a good hedge, but it didn't quite work out like that. It didn't wait very long. Yeah. Well, Jake pulls a door off of the big pipe and says he thinks he can fit into it and maybe get that hatch open from the inside. Then Gul Dukat comes on again saying, well, you haven't surrendered yet, (laughs) so they didn't wait very long. And he says he's going to release neurocene gas in three minutes. So they wave Jake into the pipe to try it out quickly. He climbs in and he starts crawling up the pipe. He eventually gets to the hatch and he's struggling to get it open. When Gul Dukat comes on again as the gas starts being released into the room, he says, rest assured your deaths will serve as an example to prevent similar incidents in the future. Oh. Fortunately, Jake gets the hatch open and Cisco and Miles quickly climb up before the gas kills them all. This scene was very reminiscent of First Contact. Do you remember the ruptured plasma coolant tank and Picard is climbing up? Yes. And there was always the voice in First Contact too, right? Of the Borg Queen. And in this one, it's constantly Gul Dukat oh. saying things that are annoying. Yeah. Oh, well, I did like it. If 
Ducat is in the background blabbering about something. I couldn't quite hear all the things he was saying, but it was typical Cardassian rhetoric. Typical bluster. Yeah. And for a little bit of humor thrown in, I, I laughed when Cisco said, I never realized how much this man's voice annoys me. Yeah. <laughs> Miles is just like, uh-huh. Now, that was a callback too. I'd pay good money if he'd just shut up. Star Trek Six. Undiscovered Country. Yep. We go back to Ops and Dax is trying to bypass the primary command pathway. We haven't bypassed any pathways in a long time. Oh, yeah. She's working seriously. She's got all the panels open. She's the only one doing anything. Everybody's just standing behind her hoping that she'll save them. Well, they get a warning from the computer that workers have escaped, and now stationwide counterinsurgency measures are being initiated. More alarms start blaring, and now all of the doors and ops close. And Gold Ducat comes on again, saying, Attention Bajoran workers, I will not allow this rebellion to succeed. If you don't surrender immediately, I'll be forced to kill all the Bajorans on the station. Well, there's two ways of handling this. The first one is trying to fix the problem, and the second way is Dax and Bashir saying, Oh, well, we'll be fine. What? Well, they're not Bajoran. Oh, oh, jeez. I was like, what? I don't know what you're saying. Okay, <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, they could just sit there and say, it's your problem, Kira. Yeah, if just, just going to kill the Bajorans. Well, Jake, Cisco, and Miles have climbed into a new tiny room. This room doesn't seem to have a useful exit either. And now they find their comm badges don't work anymore because some kind of dampening field has started. Then we go to ops and they find out they're cut off from the entire station and can't contact anyone. So Kira pulls out a phaser. Yay. About time somebody kept a phaser in ops. We've been saying this for years at this point. I have a theory here. Yeah. They finally let Kira have her phaser in ops back again. <laughs> Thank goodness. Yeah. Well, she says it's time for a less subtle approach and she fires on the controls by the door. Bashir is then able to pry the door open, but they're still held in by a force field, probably meant to keep Bajorans out. Dax is still trying to regain control of the main computer as Bashir laments the fact that he was just starting to feel like the station was home. <laughs> a home built by Cardassians, Kira reminds him. Well, this is where a Jem Hadar would come in useful. Those security fields mean nothing to them. They should have tried to learn something from the founders yeah. about the Jem Hadar being able to walk through their containment fields. Yeah, exactly. Or from the kid. When they had the kid, they should have tested it out. Could he just walk through them? Or was there some specific technology they had that oh. let them do it? Oh, that's a good point. They didn't do anything with that kid, now that I think about it. They missed an opportunity there. Yeah. Because you could learn things from him without doing invasive tests or anything that yeah. was morally reprehensible. Absolutely. Especially with Odo. Odo could actually ask him to help. And he would have just done it, yeah. Well, would that be wrong because Odo is seen as a god to them? Hmm. A little bit questionable there. Well, again, only if it was actually going to harm him. Oh, true. Okay. If, there, if it was going to cause no harm, yeah. I think you could have tried to get some info out of him or learned more about his physiology or something. Okay, yeah. I will accept that, yes. Hopefully Bashir got some info and kept it in the computer. Yeah, well, he should have like a full DNA profile of him at the very least. Yeah. So just commenting on something that Bashir said there, they're thinking of it as home. By this point, shouldn't they have like purged everything from the system? They've been there for three years. Yeah. Shouldn't you have full control over the station by now? Well, you would certainly think so. And I think we've talked a little bit about this before. My guess is that the Starfleet contingent is still quite small. Yeah. And so they probably have just been focusing on very specific areas. They've probably never even been to ore processing. You know, apart from maybe to look at it and yeah. take a survey of any equipment or, that they might be able to use. But clearly they haven't touched the computers there. But I, of course, we talked about this way in the beginning, that yeah. the first thing you would want to do is clear out all the Cardassians <laughs> oh, code yeah. and yeah, anything. But they obviously didn't do it. And again, if it were a true network, you could have. I don't know. There's some fishy stuff going on here. Right. And the other side of it is it also points to they haven't fully explored the station. Right. If they get to a loading bay that they really didn't know anything about. Right. Very true. And I would think because it's almost like this weird construction zone that they're in, Yeah. that you would put some safety protocols in various places to protect yourself from something like this. Uh -huh. Like if somebody got into trouble down in one of the I don't know, non-cleaned up places, that there would be some kind of an right. emergency transport available to them within those spaces. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. It's anything. But yeah, we, I don't know. No plan. <laughs> no plans, like usual. Just wing it. Back to security and Odo and Quark are also locked in. There's apparently no way for Odo to shapeshift his way out of it. There's a bunch of explanations about why that won't work. Very convenient explanations. Yes. <laughs> they each whine about being stuck with the other one. Quark starts poking away at Odo's computer, which irritates Odo. It looks to me like 
in this scene now Odo's belt is gone because oh. he had changed his costume yeah. at the beginning of the season and now the belt is gone. Oh. I thought the belt was good, but I guess he continues to adapt the way his uniform looks. Yeah. Still has the high collar, though, so it's not like they reverted all the way back to what it was before. But yeah. Yeah, the belt is gone. You know, I did not notice that. I will have to go back and look. Maybe belts are out on Bajor. Oh, Odo's also getting a bit of fashion smarts in there. Nice. Maybe. Well, the other thing I think this scene is starting to build on is we're seeing the writers actually work on expanding the odd couple frenemies kind of relationship between yeah, these two. Yeah, for, sure. for I, sure. I think the scenes we've seen in this episode so far with the two of them, although fairly short, they are doing more to expand that than almost anything they've done to this point. I think that's definitely true because when we get to the end of all of this, not that much happened. Yeah. So it's really just those two talking and then they have, yeah, a little thing between them, which we'll talk about. Well, back to ore processing, and the trio is trying to ram their way out of the tiny room that they're in by pushing a big cart at the door over and over. Trying to use it as a battering ram. Yes. Straight power play. Oh my god, it is the straight power play. (laughs) That's good. They decide to try and blow their way out with ore and a strong electrical charge, so they start trying to break into one of the panels on the wall in order to get power. And when Cisco pulls the handle off the ore cart and hands it to Miles, basically saying, here's a tool. The look on Mars' yeah. face was hilarious. It was like, oh, yeah, now I can work with this. And he's got this sort yeah. of goofy grin. He needed some tools and Cisco found him one. Yeah. Good leadership there. I would not describe that as leadership. <laughs> <laughs> That's problem solving. He's providing the tools for his staff to carry out their job. Problem solving. It's not leadership. <laughs> okay. In Ops, Jadzia gets zapped trying to bypass the main computer and her hands are badly burned. Ow. Bashir gives her something for the pain while a new broadcast comes on saying, now security in Ops has been compromised and a counterinsurgency program is being initiated. Well, the Ducat recordings continue to make threatening announcements. Now he says they're going to pump neurosine gas into the habitat ring in five minutes. He says all Cardassian personnel should evacuate immediately. So do you think Dax triggered that? Yes. Ah, uh, okay. Because the announcement was like, "Uh uh-oh, Ops has now been compromised because she was trying to bypass something on the panel. Gotcha. Definitely. Well, just then Garrick appears on the other side of the force field. He gives his access code and the field lets him enter Ops. Hooray, everyone thinks they're saved. (laughs) But Garrick says he really only has enough clearance to get himself through the fields and he can't use it to do anything else. It seems that Dukat didn't trust Garrick with top security codes. I would trust Garrick. I mean, he's quite an amiable fellow. If ever there was one. Yeah. So let's think about this. Garrick clearly knew about these security protocols. Couldn't he have told someone about them? I honestly don't think anybody but Ducat knew about it. I think Ducat created all this stuff kind of in secret because it's him. It's his voice. It's his face. It's his code. Uh And later we learn that only Ducat's code can stop it. So he may have done this very quietly. Ah, okay. So Garrick just tested his codes and discovered they were disabled force fields. But that's the extent of his understanding of it. Okay. Which ultimately was probably all that any Cardassian on the station could have done was get themselves through a force field to get out, to evacuate. Okay. There's also a good line from Garrick where he says, Ironic, isn't it? The only place in the galaxy that recognizes my access codes is a Bajoran space station. Yeah. I thought it was very interesting that he specifically said Bajoran station. Not like a Cardassian station under Bajoran control. I thought that, to me, was saying something. That he recognized the reality of the situation. Whereas a lot of the other Cardassians don't seem to really recognize Bajoran independence. I definitely know what you mean. I think he also doesn't have much choice in the situation. And he's maybe just kind of accepted it. I just thought it telling that he used those words. Right. Well, Garrick suggests destroying the life support system because that's where the gas would be released from. That will give them about 12 hours before the station runs out of oxygen. Garrick nods at the computer station controlling life support, and Kira waves the workers out of the way and shoots the station. (laughs) Yes. If that's all it takes to shut down life support, I think we have bigger problems than I even thought. Plus, Miles is going to be pissed. Well, it's going to be another thing for him to fix. Yeah. See, I think this is why my comment earlier about Kira's being given back her phaser is that they didn't want to arm her in ops because she'd keep on shooting things. <laughs> they might take it away now yeah. after this, after she shoots everything up in ops in one episode. <laughs> Kira, your phaser has been confiscated again. Yeah. But that scene with the two guys, that totally made me laugh because the way she <laughs> well, shouts, get away. down, <laughs> yeah. and the two of them turn around and just sprint out of there. Yeah, they know. 
because we never run on this show. Right. I'm picturing during orientation, these guys being told, when Major Kira pulls out her phaser, find cover immediately. Yeah, just run. Yeah. Well, now counterinsurgency program level two has been interrupted by the computer station being blown up. So we are now moving to counterinsurgency program level three. Gold Ducat comes back on saying, Bajorans have gained control of the station. He says the station will not be allowed to remain in Bajoran hands. So if control isn't regained in two hours, the station will be destroyed. And then we hear the computer say that the self-destruct sequence has begun. And into the ad break. This is classic Star Trek cutting. Totally. Back down in security, Quark is shooting at the door with no luck, and Odo takes the phaser away from him before he hurts himself. (laughs) Quark says Uh. he should have listened to his father and never left home, but he chose to follow the 75th rule of acquisition, which is, home is where the heart is, but the stars are made of latinum. That's kind of cute. I like that statement. Don't you think it's odd that such an insular race would have a rule like that? Definitely. Yeah, I'm not sure it fits, which is why I kind of liked it. But even as an insular race, if you look at the Nagus and how he was trying to like expand into the other quadrant, because he had learned that they had tricked everybody in the Alpha Quadrant and they had to start tricking a whole new group of people in the other quadrant. I imagine on the actual Ferengi homeworld, you really couldn't trick anybody (laughs) because (laughs) it was old news. It would be very hard. Yeah, so if you were going to try to make more money, you would have to expand beyond the Ferengi. Sort of, it's a rule that was really forced upon them. Yeah. I think here, Quark did miss an opportunity, though, to point out that shooting things usually works for Major Kira. Yeah, that's true. He could have said that. Well, Kira does it (laughs) when Odo took the face her away. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Works for her. Well, Quark says a lifetime of scheming and plotting, wheeling and dealing has gotten him nothing. All he's managed to acquire is one measly bar. Odo thinks he's done all right for himself. He says he's met a lot of Ferengi in his time, and even though some have been wealthier, none have been more devious, which makes Quark very happy. Yes, that must be a great compliment for a Ferengi. I guess so. Back to Ops, and Bashir says he can't repair Dax's damaged hands until they can get to the infirmary. Meanwhile, Garrick's access isn't allowing him to disable any of the countermeasures. He says the only person with access to help is Dukat. So Dax suggests trying to fool the computer into thinking he is Dukat. She says if they disable the sensors, the computer wouldn't be able to tell that he's not really Dukat. Garrick thinks this is a very creative idea that's worth a try. He's very impressed with this plan. Bashir thinks it's cute that a tailor can rewrite Cardassian security code, and he moons a little over Garrick. He's like behind (laughs) him, looking at him all lovingly. It's pretty funny. Yeah, this is one of those things I think that sets off the shippers. I think maybe so. Doesn't matter because... Uh Uh-oh, Dukat has left a bunch of booby traps and Garrick can't get through them before another alarm goes off and a large silver ball appears on the replicator and just starts firing at the crew. It manages to miss everyone except a random red shirt dude whose face we've never seen and never get to see and he is obliterated. Poor red shirt, totally disintegrated. Yes. This is an interesting side to Garrick as well because I've complained in the past about why can't he be direct in anything. But here, he's actually helping directly. He's getting involved. True. The difference is if his personal safety is involved. Yeah, it's true. He's very different. He's not just endlessly answering questions with questions. He's actually trying to help. Yeah. And I think when his life is in danger, then all of a sudden that facade just goes. Well, sure. We saw that in Kira the Cardassian, also known as Second Skin, where he was very direct with Sisko. Because his life was in danger. And it's nice that we're seeing that carried forward, that his characteristics that drive us nuts of, you know, answering a question with a question go out the window when it's like, okay, this could hurt me. I better go and I better go and help. Well, what's interesting about it to me is that it shows that under duress, he's the guy you want. Oh, Yes, very much so. Whereas Ducat under duress was still being his full of himself jerk. Yeah, that's a great observation. So that probably shows you a little bit of why he was in the Obsidian Order. Allegedly. Right. We go back down to ore processing and Miles and Sisko have finally got a panel off the wall and they pull out the power cable and start packing iridium around the door. Everyone is taking cover in ops as the device just keeps firing in all directions. And Kira's left her gun on the table. Yeah. Right. That seems careless. That just seems like poor weapons protocol. Well, she's not wearing a holster. That's the thing. She should just always have it on her person. Yeah. And the the Bajoran phasers are so massive. Like if she just got one of those nice little ones from Starfleet that she could always have in her pocket. Oh. If she has pockets. 
Well, suddenly, the real Gull Ducat beams right into Ops, saying it looks like someone tried duplicating his access code. Oh, this was perfect to Cat, was it not? <laughs> yes. He's standing in Ops while that thing in the replicator is just shooting at everyone. Yeah, he stands right in the line of fire, but the device just keeps firing around him. He says he was in the DMZ when he received a distress signal from himself. He says it seems the Bajoran workers are rioting on Tarek Nor, and then he <laughs>, laughs. He notices the auto-destruct program has begun. He asks if Cisco has been vaporized, but they tell him no, or at least they don't know. He's trapped in ore processing. Oh, that smug way he says, <laughs> oh, you are in trouble. Yes. He says he just needs to enter his command code to shut down the program, but first he wants to discuss some things because he's a giant jerk. Yes. He orders tea from the replicator, which stops the shooting for a second, but then it starts up again. He criticizes Kira's tone of voice just as he sees Garrick hiding and he starts to laugh. He says that alone makes the trip worthwhile. Well, then Garrick realizes that the phaser fire isn't targeting Cardassian, so he stands up. Dukat says if he'd known Garrick would have been on the station when he designed the security measures, he would have made an exception for Garrick. <laughs> and then Garrick calls him short-sighted, saying Dukat's father had the same flaw. Dukat says, my father's only flaw was trusting you. Oh, that's funny, Garrick says. At his trial, your father said his flaw was that his ambition outweighed his patriotism. Oh. Kira asks if maybe they could settle this dispute another time. Ducat finally disables the device, but won't turn off the auto-destruct before he talks to Kira in Sisko's office. And then in the office, he says, he'll be brief. But first, he knocks Sisko's baseball off the desk, oh. waiting for it to thud to the floor. Very symbolic. Well, this was his former desk. Right. Without the baseball. Or Sisko. Well, he tells her he wants to reestablish a permanent Cardassian presence aboard the station. Nothing too elaborate. A garrison, which he can deploy immediately. In return, he'll solve the current dilemma. Yeah. He thinks she has little choice right now, but Kira points out that neither Bajor nor the Federation will honor an agreement made under a death threat. Dukat says he doesn't expect them to be happy about it, but once the troops are in place, it will be very difficult for them to leave. Kira really spells it out here, though. When she says, I'd rather destroy the station before giving it back to the Cardassians. There is no question she absolutely meant that. Well, yeah, he says, I'm sure you would, but you'll also cause the death of 2,000 people. He's surprised to find out that she doesn't change her mind. Yeah. He says, well, no reason to decide now. I'll return to my ship and let you think about it. They go back out into Ops and Ducat says he'll be back in 25 minutes because it's going to auto-destruct in 30 minutes. But when he tries to beam out, nothing happens. And now a new face and voice come onto the view screen. An unfamiliar Cardassian says, Ducat, if you're seeing this, it means you tried to abandon your post while the station's self-destruct sequence was engaged. And that will not be permitted. This is outrageous, Ducat says. <laughs> yes. But the guy continues. You've lost control of Tarek Nor, disgracing yourself in Cardassia. Your attempt to escape is your final act of cowardice. All failsafes have been eliminated and your personal access codes have been rescinded. The self-destruct can no longer be halted. All you can do now is contemplate the depth of your disgrace and try to die like a Cardassian. Oh, <laughs> that was Oops. awesome. I know. I, I wrote the whole speech down because it was so funny. And the look on Ducat's face yeah. the whole time was really amusing. The way they all turn to look at him as well. Yeah, it was good. Classic. And the way he puffs himself up. Outrageous. I loved it when he said that. Yeah. This is outrageous. It's like, dude, look at yourself, yeah. okay? You just did the exact same thing. It's so, yeah, it's so typical oh, of the funny. Cardassian mindset, I think. In that situation, to bluff and Definitely. bluster and blow yourself up. Well, Definitely. quite literally. Yeah, quite literally. It was good earlier when we saw a little more of why do Cat and Garrick seem to have this rivalry. Yeah, there's definitely something going on with their history, something with Garrick and Ducat's father. Yes. That's really interesting. I have that in my notes for later of, ooh, tantalizing. Right, exactly. That points at something much bigger. Yes. I definitely have always hoped that we would find out more about Garrick's history, so I'm very intrigued. Yes. After the ad break, Ducat tries to stop the self-destruct sequence, but it doesn't work. Garrick finds this very amusing as the computer says self-destruct is in 25 minutes. Garrick and Ducat insult each other and Kira tells him to stop. <laughs> he tells them the way the station will be destroyed is the main fusion reactor will disengage the reaction stabilizers, causing it to overload. That is a mouthful of science nonsense. Technobabble. Dax figures out that the laser fusion initiator can probably be shut down from level 34, but they're currently stuck in ops. They've got to figure out a way to deactivate all the force fields at once. Back to Miles and Cisco. They're ready to test their little explosive. Miles pulls the power cable out of the wall and they take cover. He hands the cable to Cisco, who lights the fuse. They all duck and there's an explosion, giving them an escape route, and out they go. 
These guys are like the A team working on <laughs> <laughs> working on some little mission on the side. Do do do. Well, except the guy from the A team was on Next Gen. That's true. Howlin' Mad Murdoch. Back in ups, Ducat is now bragging about his security program. But he says there's no dilemma that can't be solved by a disciplined Cardassian mind. Oh. Garrick is disgusted by his attempt to impress Major Kira, saying she's too busy trying to save the station to notice his incessant posturing. That was perfect right there. That That is the perfect way of putting it. Incessant posturing. Yeah. It's so much an element of Ducat. Yeah. It This wasting time of being a blowhard when you've only got 25 minutes to try to save yourself. It's just so stupid. I think that's what was driving Garrett crazy. Yeah. Garrick also says she has much too much taste to be attracted to him, a married man. <laughs> Ducat says, I should have executed you years ago. You tried, Garrick says. Wow. Bashir now tries to stop the ridiculous arguing, which is just burning <laughs> precious time. Garrick, this isn't helping. No. Dax then suggests they try to cause a power surge. Dax, meanwhile, the only one trying to save them, right? She's just throwing out ideas. <laughs> She's always got something. So she suggests they try to cause a power surge and short out all the force fields at once. Kira says that might even eliminate the dampening field that's hampering comms. So Dukat suggests using the Cardassian neutralization emitters, science, science, science. Yes. The power surge will cause a loss of the turbo lifts and transporters, but it should get rid of the force fields. Dukat seems quite delighted by this plan. He's really hamming it up in this scene, didn't you think? Yeah, my note says he's so over the top. Yeah. I feel this is the act of very much getting what Dukat is and what Cardassians are like, mm. that they would play this up, the self-importance aspect of it. Yeah. The other side of that is, I think, showing the Cardassian superiority over these lesser species. I thought that was what was happening here. I guess that could be it. I was looking at it more like maybe the actor was overdoing it. Yeah. And the actor playing Garrick was actually doing a better job, but I hadn't thought about it from that perspective. He was just so busy still trying to uphold his Ducatness. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. We also get more of the conflict between Ducat and Garrick, which seems crazy that even in this situation where time is of the essence, they're arguing. Yeah, they actually hate each other more than they hate dying. Right. They're yeah. trading petty insults. <laughs> yes. Do you get the feeling that all Cardassian meetings are like this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Down in the bowels of the station, Miles, Sisko, and Jake are being thwarted by all the force fields. They're trying to figure out how to get to Ops, and they start trying to pry open a turbo lift door. Back to Ops, and Ducat is on the floor trying to get these emitters back online. He seems to take forever, but he finally gets them online, and they trigger the power surge. There's a big shake, and Kira immediately calls Sisko. She says they have about 10 minutes before the main reactor core overloads and destroys the station. Someone needs to disengage the laser fusion initiator at one of the control junctions on level 34, but there are no turbo lifts or transporters available. Sisko says he and Miles will head to level 34, and he tells Kira to start evacuating people as quickly as possible. Then he tries to get Jake to head to run about Pad C, but he refuses, and they all head out together. Well, we haven't had a station evacuation in a while. <laughs> no. In security, we hear there are only seven minutes left now until the reactor overloads. Kira calls to say the force fields are deactivated, but Odo finds the force field around his office is still on. He says it was obviously put on a different power system in order to keep him inside in an emergency. Which Quark says is probably because the Cardassians knew he was an honorable man who would do the right thing. And now his integrity is going to get them both killed. <laughs> oh. That was great. That was great. Quark goes back to poking around in Odo's computer. Yep. Which does not seem like the thing Quark would do with only seven minutes left, but that's what he's doing. I don't know. Maybe he's trying to help. I don't know. It seems like in other situations, he's just screaming. I think he's actually trying to help because computer stuff and hacking is something that he is actually proven to be quite competent at. Right. So Miles, Sisko, and Jake are, I can only describe this as sauntering to level 34, despite the fact that we are now down to five minutes. There's no running on the station. Nobody's running. It's completely ridiculous how we are just walking slowly <laughs> to this level. Do, uh, do, do, do. Yeah, they could play like elevator music with the speed that these guys are walking. Well, Cisco says there may not be time to disengage the fusion emitters, but they could instead let the explosion happen, but direct it into the shields. So Miles thinks that's a good idea. It's the only thing that could absorb all the energy. Cisco's the idea man here. Yes. Well, then they run into an obstacle and the hallway is blocked, so they need to crawl through the conduits. I mean, come on, we all knew this would end with people crawling through the conduits. Oh, yeah. But when Miles opens the maintenance conduit, there appears to be plasma fires on all sides throughout the conduit. So this is not good. But they're going to go through it anyway, because we're down to three minutes now. This is classic Star Trek. This is truly classic Star Trek. Oh, totally. 
This is almost Galaxy Quest funny at the end. Yes. He tells Jake to stay put and he tears off his sleeves to protect his hands as he crawls through the hot conduit. Miles follows him in. Honestly, I don't think there's any way they could really survive that heat in there, but okay. In they go. An explosion knocks Miles over. He tries to keep going, but he can't. Cisco pushes ahead with no time to spare. He gets to the junction and starts working on it, all while calling Miles continuously to see if he's okay, but Miles isn't responding. Jake hears this and he climbs into the conduit and starts dragging Miles out. I think this is showing more of that Jake growing up. Oh, yeah. He's going out on a limb to try and save Miles. It's sort of, he's not the kid anymore. Well, and also he gets so many positive role models. Yes, that's true. With Miles, who would just do anything. Yeah. And with his father, who's always doing the heroic thing. So I think he's got a lot of really positive role models in his life, probably to counteract some of the negative ones, (laughs) like (laughs) Nog. (laughs) That's a very good point. Yeah. Well, we get all the way down to 30 seconds as Jake pulls Miles out and Cisco frantically works. Although I don't know what Cisco is doing. He's like, this is a typical Star Trek thing of pulling things out and putting them back in somewhere else. Who knows? How could you do that under such duress and have it make any (laughs) sense? But Miles says to Jake after he pulls him out, your father told you to stay out of there. And Jake says, well, if you don't tell him, I won't. Very cute. They have a little bonding moment. A little bonding. Well, the overload happens finally, and we see the station from the outside as the explosion occurs and the shields absorb the explosion. Why would you need the shields to absorb the explosion? Couldn't it just explode out into space? I don't know. I don't know anything about science. (laughs) I believe this falls under Star Trek science. So Okay, okay. (laughs) I guess they thought they would just dampen it and there would be no harm to surrounding ships or something. Okay. Uh, Yeah. Well, what if there were a bunch of ships docked within the shields? Didn't think about that. Well, it wouldn't be so good for them. Fortunately, it didn't happen. Well, Cisco falls to the ground in success and Miles calls him saying he's all right. There was a really nice little touch here. When Cisco sits against the wall, yep. he does that little hand movement. Yes. It was like a little gotcha. That was cute. I thought you would like that. This is where I wonder how much Avery brought to that character that wasn't scripted. It seemed a very organic thing for him to do. It did. Yeah. Back to security and the door opens finally and the force field drops. But Quark has found Odo's file on him. It says, <laughs> a self-important con artist, nowhere near as clever as he thinks he is. <laughs> Odo says, I told you to stay off my computer. And Quark says, but two hours ago, you said I was the most devious Ferengi you'd ever met. Well, Odo says, I thought we were going to die, so I was being nice. <laughs> <laughs> and they walk off into the promenade, arguing, like friends. The end. Well, he says, name one Ferengi more devious than I am. The Grand Nagus. <laughs> and he says, name another one. And then, he, yeah, he keeps naming people. Uh, yeah. Mostly Quark's relatives. And he was definitely picking on him because he says Rom, I think, is the third one. Oh, yeah. Well, Rom did try to kill Quark, remember? Yeah. So he also is devious. Okay, well, that's the end of the episode. Let's hear your over analysis. First of all, so Ducat was patrolling the DMZ. Why was he patrolling a demilitarized zone? Doesn't a demilitarized zone mean you keep the military out? Of that zone. <laughs> so, Unless you're Cardassian, because yeah. then it doesn't matter. I... They do what they want. Yes. It's only yeah. DMZ for the Federation. The Cardassians, it's fine. Mm-hmm. Has anybody actually checked to see whether Admiral Necheyev is actually a Cardassian infiltrator? Oh, my gosh. Check for her molar being removed. Yeah. Does she have all her teeth? Uh, I'm pretty sure they need to do a DNA scan on her. She's not a good admiral. No, <laughs> no. Well, all admirals are evil. Or incompetent (gasps) bureaucrats. Oh, gosh. I never thought of that. That might precisely be it. They're just bureaucrats. Yeah. So competency isn't really a necessary uh, skill set. We've talked about that before, that they're stuck in politics and not able to really think strategically or... Yeah. Although, you know, it would be really challenging to Mm -hmm. be a politician who is able to think about the universe... (laughs) Right. It's hard enough if we just look at politicians in America. I think it would be very difficult to be making these kinds of decisions, especially as we established living in paradise. Yeah. Well, it would become exponentially harder, I think, the more worlds. And then you're also dealing with different cultures. Yeah. Like we said about the trill. Is it that the trill are completely wired differently, so don't even think the same way as humans? Scale that up to dozens of worlds with people who don't think the same way as you do. You would have to deploy a command structure out to the different areas and give them pretty much the freedom to do what needed to be done in that region. 
They don't do that on Star Trek, but that's what you would have to do. I would think so. A lot more autonomy into the, the various areas. Yeah, you would have to. You can't make a decision light years away. You've got to be able to make some decisions yeah. on the fly. Yeah. Now let's move on to the computer systems. <laughs> okay. I'm really surprised by now that they haven't locked out all non-core systems from access to the core of the station. So you have a terminal in all processing that apparently has full access to the rest of the station. I think well, we need to have a conversation about security. Not necessarily. Why is that? It's on the network. Yeah. Even if it's not on the network, if there was some way for it to send a message to the main network and trigger something there, yeah. it doesn't mean that it has full access. I it think it somehow managed to tell the computer in ops that something bad was happening. I took it that the program, the whole counterinsurgency program, was running from that system in or processing. Oh, well. That's how I interpret could it. Could have been. Because, yeah, if that was the one file that they hadn't been able to delete. Exactly. Interesting. So there's probably subspace shunts all over the place. <laughs> oh, jeez. It's wide open. There's some hand wavy, as usual, <laughs> computer stuff going on. Yes. We still haven't, though, topped the, we downloaded the file and, oh, my God, we want to get it off the system, so we're going to re-upload it and it'll be fine. Yeah, put that file in the doghouse. <laughs> Or the deep code. What was it? Oh, what gosh. was the Dax was finding yes. files in the deep code or something? Yes. That <laughs> it was is, like the dark web. <laughs> that is correct. Oh, dear. I'll give them a break because of this, because it's a Cardassian station. They don't always know what they're dealing yeah. with. They're not super versed in it. So it would make sense that maybe they think they have things all wardened off in the different parts of the network, but they don't. Right. Because there's these stupid little secret things going on. That nobody in Starfleet would have done on a ship. Yeah. But the station is this a whole different Wild West world. And I think that's what they're aiming at here. More of yeah, that. Yeah, that's what they're trying to convince yeah. us of. Yeah. It's, it's a wing and a prayer kind of thing. <laughs> right. Which leads on to, I think this episode happened far too late. This is a season one, yeah. maybe a season two but season three, I think it's too late for this kind of nonsense. Well, I agree with you in terms of the technology. It would have made more sense if this had happened maybe second half of season one. Yes. Yes. But the ability of these people to function as a team would not have made as much sense until after the beginning of season two. Agreed. That aspect of it does come into play very much in this episode. But even some of the basic things, I think, that cause a problem of, didn't anybody notice that they still had neurocene gas canisters hooked up? Well, I, yeah, I had that note. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where's the gas? Yeah. <laughs> Although it was a good episode. I just feel it was happening too late. There was a lot of, a lot of hand wavy in here. Well, I would say one thing a little differently, which mm -hmm. is that one of my complaints in the episode Invasive Procedures from the beginning of season two, yeah. which is the one where everybody's evacuated right. and Lionel Luther comes to steal Dax. Great episode. In that episode, I complained that they should have made that ion storm or whatever it was a character. Right. And they missed an opportunity to be reacting more to that storm. And I feel like they're kind of doing that with the station. Ah. That that's a character on this show. Yeah. I don't know how long this will go on, but there were some cases, like even in early TNG, where the ship was a character. Yes, yes. And like the holodeck glitches, you know, early on. So I'm thinking that this is kind of the same thing here, where there's got to be some crazy stuff still going on in the station that allows the station to be a character. Yes. There's not necessarily an enemy to fight, but they can band together to try to overcome a problem I would on agree. the station. That makes a lot more sense now. If I look at it in that context, yeah, this becomes a plot point and a plot style Yeah, within exactly. the greater story. Okay, yes. Which is funny that I say that because early on, I found it really annoying yeah. that the station was a character and the station was just this sort of dump that we were dealing with. Yeah. But now I like it more, I think because we've come a long way since then. Uh, in terms of other development. And it's not just the main point. Yeah. And also they work together to solve the problem, which of course I love. Right. So. Yeah. It worked on team cohesion in this episode much more than a lot of the previous episodes have. <laughs> yes. Okay. I will accept your answers there. They're very good. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> this again is slightly leading on from that. 
Now, considering that there's a huge threat from the Delta Quadrant, yep. this is the bridgehead between the two quadrants. Shouldn't the Federation have just been dumping resources into the station? This is potentially the most important place in the Alpha Quadrant, and they're still struggling with basic maintenance and computer systems. Well, remember that weird thing that Cisco said when he showed up with the Defiant? Yeah. That, well, now that the Borg threat is less eminent, we're not focused on that anymore. <laughs> And we, and you and I are like, what? <laughs> right. How is the, what are you talking about? Because first contact hasn't even happened yet. So we know that's coming. The Borg threat is still real. But I'm wondering if this is a similar thing. If your resources are so spread out, mm -hmm. you are focused on the big fires. And this has gone quiet a little bit. And so you're not super focused on that. And also, you said a really interesting thing about that. I'm not sure which episode, but you said... Maybe they're just thinking that this is a Cardassian Bajoran problem. Neither one of these groups are in the Federation. So if the Jem Hadar come in to that quadrant right there, they're going to have to deal with the Bajorans and the uh, Cardassians, and then yeah. we'll just clean up after. Right. So there is a possibility that that's what they're thinking. But if that is really what they're thinking, you'd almost think they would then get their people out of Deep Space Nine yeah. and just let it be. Yeah, it becomes a very minor problem for them and they look at it as they have a presence there so that they're making a show effort as it were yeah that is a little bit of a cynical take i'll admit that it is a little cynical take but it makes sense yeah. they can't be putting entire fleets at every problem they just there's no way they would have enough yeah but you would think there were other systems around there of federation planets who might be interested yes they might deploy people yeah okay next point I like how we get a hint at the background between Garrick and Dukat. Oh, yeah. It had been presented before as just sort of a, a petty Cardassian rivalry, which I think yeah. defines Cardassians being petty. Like a power struggle. Yeah. But yeah, clearly more. This is my only note in my over analysis notes yeah. <laughs> is the same thing, is this hint of that complex relationship and that complex past between Garrick and Dukat is so tantalizing. I really want to understand it. And the revelation that Garrick apparently caused Dukat's father's downfall? Wow. I want to know more about this. I don't remember any of this, to be honest. Remember when they did that thing in the trial in Tribunal, uh -huh. right before they were going to basically execute Miles? Right. And they gave Keiko the opportunity to disavow herself from him. I would think they would have done the same thing oh. in every trial. I'm surprised that Ducat wouldn't have been asked the same question to disavow himself from his father. I wonder if he did. I would expect he would. Yeah. It's also interesting. I hope there is something there. Although I also kind of like the hints, if they don't ever tell us exactly. If they give us a lot of little hints like this, that also could be a good storytelling Well, it fits technique. with Garrick as well. Of He doesn't really want to admit to his past or the elements right. of his past. Right. And that, that is a real focal point of that character. For Garrick? Yeah. I also like this thing with Garrick where he is very in the moment. Mm -hmm. And we saw it in The Wire. Yes. Where he was... You know, he was saying things he didn't necessarily want to say, but as soon as the moment was over and he was okay, he went right back to his normal yeah. self and he had no interest in talking about what had happened. It's like, oh, that's <laughs> all in the past. And I, it seemed really similar here uh -huh. where, hey, I'm focused on trying to help here, but I'm quite sure he's back to being the tailor the next day and being just as obscure as he always is. Oh, absolutely. I, I wouldn't yep. even doubt it. <laughs> this episode also leads me to looking at Garrick as much more of a man out of place, in that he has this idyllic view of Cardassia. Always. And I don't mean that just from his exile. I think he probably always has. Yeah, oh, always. Yeah. And this idea of patriotism. He's a true believer. Yes. Whereas mm -hmm. I think Dukat represents the Cardassia of reality. Yeah. The rust behind the painted facade. Bluff, bluster, yeah. personal ambition. And most importantly, incompetence. <laughs> yeah. And this is where I think it makes Garrick much more fascinating. He needs to be a true believer for his exile to be tragic. Yeah. Because otherwise it would be way less interesting that he were exiled there. That's what makes it fascinating of he's exiled from a place that doesn't really exist other than in his imagination. Right. Cardassia isn't like what he wants it to be. It's the tragedy of life. <laughs> 
the real world seldom lives up to what we'd like it to be. That's so true. And finally, possibly finally. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Odo and Quark. So either the writers have figured out where they wanted to go with these two characters, or they just marathoned the odd couple and figured out how to write this type of relationship. <laughs> well, it is funny how they're sort of drawn to each other. Yeah. Anytime something bad happens, but they're also just right across the hallway from each other yeah. on the promenade. So there's that too. But also you could just think Quark runs to Odo because in terms of who could protect him, Odo is the one who's most oh, able yeah. to protect him. And he's not sure Kira would, even though she would probably be number two on the list. No, I think Odo, <laughs> he would look after Quark despite what he thinks of Quark. Right. Exactly. Exactly. It's almost like a brother relationship where yeah. Quark is the little brother and they're constantly at odds and even competing a little yeah. bit. But, you know, they're still going to run together when they need to. Yeah. It's cute. And I think the writing is actually working for this kind of frenemies relationship more so than they've ever managed it. I seriously think that Agreed. they have figured Agreed. something out because it yeah. feels like a tonal change. I believe that. The scenes in this one, although short, really, really make that kind of work. And it makes so much more sense than Dax standing up for the Ferengi. Yeah. I get it that there's a history with her previous host, right? Yeah. Dax's previous host. Right. But still, it never makes sense to me that she defends them. Mm -hmm. It makes sense to me that Odo does because Odo really defends everyone yeah. because that's his internal sense of justice that he has, yeah. his own justice. And I think he would do the same for anyone, really. He does see that nobody else stands up for Quark. And so I think that makes him do it a little bit more. Right. Yeah, it goes back to his everybody is equal. He can see yeah. the flaws in the Ferengi, but he doesn't consider them lesser. Well, he has such a unique perspective yes. on being the only one of his kind until now. He knows that there are others, but he's had this unique perspective of being sort of persecuted and feeling persecuted and feeling like other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, except feeling like other while being one of the most powerful creatures <laughs> around oh. is a very unique yeah. situation to be in. And again, something that as a writer would have been really cool to write. And they don't always make good yeah. use of it. Yeah. But yeah, he's he's an interesting character from that point of view. And also in this point, I think it underscores the change in Odo. Whether this was deliberate or whether it was an unintentional side effect of them trying to soften this character and work on this relationship, mm -hmm. Odo seems different. He seems less, if you like, less crabby. He seems oddly more relatable. Because of his interaction with the founders, I would think. Yeah. I would think that's the point. Yeah. And I don't know whether that was deliberate in the writing that yeah. they planned this or this is just something of they're improving their writing of Odo. Well, if we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt, I would think it makes a lot of sense yeah. for him to have been impacted by the interaction with the founders, especially since he went into that so cranky right. and unpleasant. So the point should have been that that was a changing moment for him, like almost a foundational moment for him, Yeah, that it would change the way that he sees himself and the way that he sees others, at least to a small degree. I would give him the benefit of the doubt. I don't usually, but I might here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that it. wraps it up for me. Okay. Well, you covered my one topic in overanalysis, so I'll just go right to women in the future. Okay. Dax and Garrick were really the only ones actively trying to save the station. <laughs> What about so, Kara? <laughs> well, but she didn't have a lot of ideas of how to save the station. She was there to help when somebody would throw an idea out to help implement it. But she's not a science officer. So I think that what I really liked was that Dax was just, what about this? What about this? What about this? Yeah. You know, she was doing the thing that you, you need somebody on your team who is willing to throw out ideas, the ideator, right? But you yeah. also need a person who can execute. I think Kara is the execute. And I don't mean that in terms of executing <laughs> with the phaser. <laughs> But I, I do feel like she would get stuff done. Yeah. But what the heck was Bashir doing? And Dukat was not helping at all until forced into it. My point is it was nice that Dax was part of trying to solve the problem. I thought she was playing the role of the science officer really well. And there was no creeping on her at all, which was amazing because she is always the butt of that. Yeah. So that was good. Dukat was busy being a jerk. <laughs> Kira was trying to maintain some control and that was fine. Yeah. And also trying to make sure that not every Bajoran gets killed again. Again. And Bashir was kind of 
like extra. He didn't really have anything to do except maybe moon over his new love of his life, Garrick, which is fine because this isn't <laughs> Garrick's place of work. This is always my point is that this place of work. <laughs> so the only negative really for women in the future here was Ducat kind of trying to creep on Kira, which Garrick called out. And of all people, finally, someone stands up for the women and it's Garrick. This is the thing that when Quark was being disgusting to Kira in ops, in her place of work, during her duty. So she's actually working on the clock, as it were. And Miles just standing there doing yeah. anything. Garrick is the only person who actually calls out the bad behavior. Now, of course, there were other reasons why he did it. But still, I appreciated that. Like, that's what needs to happen. You need people who have some power to stand up for you in those situations. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Did you see that as creeping on Kira? Well, that's what Garrick said it was. Yeah. I took that as it was Garrick kind of mocking Ducat. He might have been. Ducat was puffing up his chest, doing the Cardassian thing. Well, it might not matter if he really was yeah. in that scenario, that he's just trying to take his dig at him. But also he might know something, that that's what Ducat does with women all the time. Or he also might know that he's got some sort of perversion about Bajoran women. Who knows? Ah, okay. But either way, at least Garrick stood up for Kira. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Although you're right. It, Kira didn't necessarily see that that was happening. But you, you don't always. You can be oblivious to nonsense <laughs> like that. Until it's right in your face. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, back off. But anyway, that's all that I had for women in the future. Overall, it was a pretty good episode for women. Yes. So let's go to rating. Thumbs up, thumbs down, or neutral. What is your rating? Oh, absolute thumbs up. Loved it. Great episode on so many levels. So many pieces of it just clicked. Yeah, I agree. Thumbs up. I really love this kind of Star Trek episode. Teamwork saves the day. Yeah. Anytime they would do that on TNG where they would be cut off from each other within the ship and they'd each have to solve the problems in front of them. I really like that. Those are some really cool episodes. And then we also throw in a little love between father and son and Jake being a hero. Yeah. I mean, come on. That was adorable. <laughs> <laughs> and Ducat being knocked down a peg. You know, all good stuff. Oh, yeah. I think that was another piece of the episode that worked so well. The level of military command above Ducat didn't even trust him to do his job correctly. That was actually very funny. And I did not see that coming at all. I really laughed out loud when that happened. Yeah, perfect. And I also love the extreme dislike between Garrick and Ducat. Yeah. I thought that was very good and very well done. They've hinted at it before, but it was really good here. Thumbs way up. This might be my favorite episode so far this season. Wow. Pretty good. Yeah. Although there have been a lot of good ones this season, really only one bad one. So This was also such a Star Trek trope episode. Oh, yeah. If you're a fan of Star Trek, this had all the classic elements in it. For sure. At the end of my notes where I wrote the end, the end of the episode, uh -huh. the next thing I wrote was, that was good, very Star Trek. Oh, agreed. Yeah. Okay. That wraps up season three, episode seven. Come back next week for episode eight. Definitely an improvement from episode six. Absolutely. In the meantime, if you'd like to tell us your own overanalysis of this or any episode, or if you just want to say something nice, you can email us at rebingeit at gmail.com, or you can tweet us at rebingeit. You can also check us out on talkthroughmedia.com. You can leave feedback there for individual episodes, and you can also listen to the other podcasts on our network. Thanks for joining us on the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. That's it for me. And that's it from me. 